So, Lord God, we thank you for the garden and the joy we share as we tarry there that none other has ever known because it's in our heart. It's in my heart. And so you know me, the weird, strange thing that I can't quite figure out. You know me, and I know you, and you know every person in this room, and so you do with us and you talk with us and so God I I pray that you would help us um, to believe in Jesus name God is salvation um, help us to preach amen well we've been preaching through Romans you know and uh, so right now remember everything that you've learned over the last year all right Romans chapter 12 Verse 1, Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the compassions of God, present your bodies a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your logical worship service. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the of God, the good, the pleasing, and perfected. Now that's what we preached on last week, that Jesus did not sacrifice, end all sacrifice, but he sacrificed that we would sacrifice ourselves with him. And I think if we could just get that through our head and into our, our hearts, it would really transform the way that we viewed the will and the work of God both in the past and right now. I think we're all a bit disturbed that God would call for all that sacrifice in the Old Testament, right? And we're horrified that God would have Israel sacrificially devote entire cities to him. We're all horrified that God would be so violent. And, and I think we all try to explain it away, but it's terribly hard to explain away. And upon close inspection, it seems that he's not less violent than we feared, but maybe more violent. It's not, Can it's not only Canaanite villages like Jericho that are devoted to destruction in the Old Testament. That is harem in Hebrew. It means set apart as a sacrifice to God, it's not only Canaanite towns, it's also Edom. That's the descendants of Esau, Isaiah 34, verse 5. And it's not only Edom, it's Israel. That's the descendants of Jacob, Isaiah 42, 8. And it's not only Canaanites, Edomites, and Israelites, it's all the nations, Isaiah 34, verse 2. The Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host, he has devoted them to destruction, haram, human sacrifice. An Israelite would sacrifice an animal in the temple. The priest would take the lamb, for instance, and just slaughter it with a, a big knife. The body would be burned outside the camp in the case of the sin offering. It would be burned on the altar, burned up in the case of the burnt offering and used for like a communal barbecue and along with, with most of the other offerings. So far from our assumption, the temple was like the location of these great banquets, barbecues. The body of the sacrifice, the, the bag of dirt, the Adamah, was disposed of in a variety of ways. That's what I'm saying. But the blood belonged to God for the life was in the blood. Yeah, Mike, you have Oh, I'm cutting out, okay. We were talking about human sacrifice, of course, and what sacrifice is, and the fact that uh, when they sacrifice in the temple, the, the body, the, the body of sacrifice, the bag of dirt, the Adamah is the Hebrew, well, it was disposed of in a variety of ways. But the blood, the blood belonged to God because the life is in the blood. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest then would take the blood behind the curtain and sprinkle it on the atonement seat, which was the throne of God on earth. So it was clear that God wanted the blood because the life is in the blood. You know, technically God cannot take a life. Technically God cannot 
murder. He can't take a life. Why? Well, because the life was and always is his. So in sacrifice, his life, the life, returns to him behind the curtain. The curtain that separated this age from the age to come. So the Israelites must have wondered, <laughs> what's on the other side of that curtain? In terror, people assume that the other side is something like endless torture for sacrificial victims. But this is the weird, strange thing about sacrifices. God didn't hate sheep. Didn't hate lambs, didn't hate goats, didn't hate pigeons. He made them and he referred to them as pleasing gifts. And that's also the way he referred to Canaanites, Edomites, Israelites, and all the, all, the, all the nations. I mean, sure, he was angry with him, and yet they were all holy to him. Harem. By the way, that's where the Arabs get their word harem, as in the king's harem. You know, the priests didn't torture the sacrifices. They slaughtered them the way you, the butcher slaughters the beef that turns into your hamburger. And when the ancient Israelites were told to slaughter Canaanites, God made it clear that there would be no enslavement, no torture, for these people were holy to him, his harem. Now, that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, this is important, we're no longer to sacrifice lambs or our enemies. But we are told to present our own bodies as a sacrifice to God. The violence is terrifying. I mean, it's terrifying to think that God would violate our will. And that's what violence is, right? That's also what discipline is. If my father had never violated my will, well, my life would be hell right now. If a parent refuses to violate a toddler's will, that toddler will soon, well, within a matter of hours, probably be dead. And if God doesn't violate your will, you will be enslaved to your will. In biblical terms, you will be enslaved to your sin, and Jesus came to save us from our sin, because our sin is hell. But here's a wild thought. God cannot violate your will if you freely surrender your will. If you kneel in a garden and pray, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And like we preached last time, that kind of sacrifice is called love, and love is life, and life is freedom and power. It's power to enjoy the party, the Father's party. It turns out that the other side of the curtain is just the opposite of hell, just the opposite of Hades, just the opposite of hell. The other side of the curtain is the kingdom of heaven. So you see, if we could just believe what Paul has been preaching I think it would utterly transform our view of what God has done in the past and what God is doing right now, right now. Right now, we're sitting in a worship service or uh, actually even more, maybe watching online as I preach the word and I prepare us for communion. Years ago, I would have people raise hands at the end of messages and make commitments kind of like they were judging the word. You know what I mean? I accept the word. I do not accept the word. About 20 years ago, I realized that the word was judging them. And so I started asking, well, God, what are you asking me to ask people to do at the end of messages? And I felt like he was saying, well, Peter, why don't you compel them to come to my banquet, to join you at my table, Peter, you don't need to protect me from them. That's what the church has sometimes said. But you might want to remind them that they may need some protection from me. So teach them to pray. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Because, Peter, that's what you're serving for dinner. My will. Jesus. Nineteen years ago, I was driving down from... Lookout Mountain, you know, where the church was, and I think it must have been a Saturday night. I was alone in the car, just me and, and my, my daughter, one of, one of my daughters. I think she must have been about 14 at the time. 
And I remember out of the silence, she said, um, Dad, um, I, uh, I saw something tonight at the worship service. Now, I need to say that you shouldn't simply believe everyone who says they have a vision. Sometimes people are describing what they hope to see or what they want to see. Sometimes they're describing what they think you should see. But when people have visions who don't want to have visions and have no need to deceive, well, then I especially pay attention. Apparently distressed, she said, Daddy, um, when people came forward to communion tonight, and that would have been a lot of people at the Saturday night service up on the mountain. She said, as they came forward to communion, so walking down the aisle, I saw these like cutter things. That's what she called them, cutter things. She said these cutter things like swung out of the walls and started cutting off people's hands and arms and legs and heads. And I said, oh, honey, I'm, I'm sorry. That must have been terrifying. And she said, well, well, no, actually, Dad, it was really cool because after the cutter things would like cut off their hands and legs, they would like hobble up to the communion table and then they would take communion and then they would start to hobble around the table and bump into each other. And she said when they bumped into each other in the place that they had been cut, they would like fuse. And so dad, everybody's like hobbling around the table, bumping into each other and fusing in that spot until they're all like fused together into this one giant man who could not be hurt and so was never afraid. Now I've shared that vision before because now I see that absolutely everywhere in scripture. You see, I think my daughter caught a glimpse of the other side of the curtain. <laughs> Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the compassions of God, to present your bodies a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your logical worship service. Do not be conformed. Now, that's a passive imperative verb. In other words, Paul is commanding us to let something happen. If you were speaking in Old English, you're saying, he is uh, saying, suffer this to happen. Suffer something. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed. That's also a passive imperative verb. Suffer this transformation. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Every one of our minds constructs a map of reality, a psyche in Greek, often translated soul, but also translated life which is really unfortunate. For another Greek word is also translated life, but that life refers to the life that's in the blood, the zoe, the spirit, the breath that's in the blood, and that life is indestructible. But the psyche, the earthen vessel that contains the life, which you refer to as your life, well, that is like entirely destructible. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, the good, the pleasing, and the perfected by dokimazo, by trial and error. By a journey through this age of space and time, may you come to know the good, but not as a law, but as like a, a life, the very life in, in your veins. For by the grace given to me, writes Paul, I say to everyone in you, among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. I, I say, writes Paul, not to think of oneself more highly than one ought. I don't think Paul is saying, look, it's okay for Alan maybe to think of himself at, you know, level five of righteousness, but not level six on the universal righteousness scale. Paul has already told us, none is righteous, no, not one. And he just told us that faith is assigned to us by God 
And he's already told us that faith is reckoned as righteousness, because it is. And you remember, he spent a whole bunch of time teaching us that we're justified, we're made right by faith in Christ's blood. Like oxygen is in the blood, the spirit in the blood. Karl Barth writes that the crucified Christ is the measure of faith that God has dealt to each man. So thinking soberly is thinking grace. Like Paul discovered on the road to Damascus. Everything, Paul, absolutely everything is gift, and most of all, faith. And Christ is the measure of that gift. In Christ is the fullness of God. So I don't think that there could be a measure bigger than Jesus. In fact, Jesus says this in John 3. He, that he gives his spirit without measure, like an endless supply of breath in an endless river of blood called eternal life, like he's like pumping the life at you all the time. And yet Jesus did say, the measure you give is the measure you get. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So this is the picture that emerges in in my mind, in, in the beginning, God breathed his, his breath into an earthen vessel named Adam. He loved Adam, but Adam did not and could not love him in return. Adam took the life of love, but he refused to surrender the life in return, and so God required the life of Adam. In other words, he died. <laughs> In the words of Solomon, uh, the breath returned to the one who gave it, and the dust returned to the earth as it was. Well, in the end, which is always the new beginning, God breathed his breath into another earthen vessel named Jesus. The eschatos, the ultimate Adam. He loved Jesus, and Jesus loved him in return. God didn't take Jesus' life. Why? Well, because Jesus freely surrendered his life of his own accord. That's what he said. On the tree in the garden, he surrendered his spirit. He died. In his words, into your hands I commit my spirit. And lo and behold, God breathed his spirit right back into Jesus. He rose from the dead. And Jesus breathed his spirit into his uh, disciples. And then uh, his disciples started loving each other uh, without, without measure. You know, um, when I love in this age, in this age, when and where one moment necessarily follows another moment in space and time, that is when I sacrifice in this age, it often hurts. Ow, ouch, 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 ouch. Why is that? It's because the moment, the space and time of the giving, is not the same as the space and the time of the receiving. One experiences pain, while another experiences pleasure. But what if the moment of giving were also the very moment of receiving? I mean, what if I no longer considered myself, you know, like a, like a container for life, but I considered myself a conduit for life? Now, they didn't have any um, earthen pipes at Home Depot, so we have to settle for um, PVC, okay? But, but what if uh, the measure I gave was always the measure that I received? And so the giving and the receiving were, were constant, Well, then the sacrifice would never be death, right? It would always be life. And, and not a, a little life, 
but all the life constantly flowing through me as an eternal river of life in the eternal body of Christ, an endless measure of Christ. And, and now here's a question that I really cannot answer. I mean, if that were the case, if I always loved as I'm being loved, if, if I always gave as if it were given to me, well, who would I be? In this age, you see, my consciousness is trapped in an earthen vessel that I refer to as, as me, but where does consciousness reside in a, in a body? We think the head or the heart, right? But the logic in the head manifests and is present in every part of the body or I'm paralyzed. And the blood in the heart pumps through all of uh, the body uh, in all of those pipes, all of those vessels, pumps through all the body and the blood. Paul wrote this. Listen closely to this. This is like the sense that just blows my mind. He writes, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So, who's talking? Paul, who's dead? Or Christ, who just said, I, using Paul's tongue and lips and mouth. The life is in the blood, but the blood is not only in one vessel, but all the vessels. So what am I? Which I think of as me. I must be something like a waterfall. Right? What, what is a waterfall? What is Niagara Falls? Well, it's the shape of the Niagara River at a particular point. So what is it in itself? What is it really? Well, it is the Niagara River, which is also the Great Lakes, which if you understand the water cycle is also all the oceans on the surface of all the earth. So here's another question. Is Niagara Falls more Niagara Falls by damming the river? In other words, if Niagara Falls gets nervous about whether it's going to get more water and decides to just hang on to the water, is it more Niagara Falls by damming the river or by letting it flow? That is, by losing its life and finding it constantly. Ah, stuff to think about when you go for a walk. Verse four, for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function, so we though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts, charisma, that differ according to the chorus, the grace given to us, let us use them. But I put a line through let us use them on the screen up there. Now we need to say I'm putting lines through words in the ESV translation that you see on the screen. And I'm not doing that to say that they're necessarily wrong or totally wrong. I'm just giving you the more literal translation. So this is important. A translator always wants the words to make sense to you. But the word of God is meant to make sense of you. So by making the words make sense to us, we often don't allow them to make sense of us. That is, to cut us. Does that make sense? Well, this phrase, let us use them, it's not in the text at all. We, we, we don't use grace. Grace uses us. Let, 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 functions as a passive imperative verb in English, but even a passive imperative is an imperative. In other words, it's a commandment. It's something you have to do. It's a law. And so I've spent countless hours, I mean, maybe this is your experience true, you know, desperately trying to, oh, let God use me. And the harder I try to let, the less I actually do. Well, these words, let us use them, aren't in the text. And in the next seven verses, which I'm about to read to you, there are no imperative verbs in the Greek text at all. But, the translator has added 
13. And this is the ESV, so it's pretty good. It's even worse than other translations. 13, added 13 imperatives, which turns 13 revelations into 13 laws. And so now I'm going to read what you can read in any good interlinear. An interlinear is just where they translate each individual word and they keep the verb tense just the same. Well, you can read what uh, modern translators usually put in the text, the part I have crossed out on the screen. Paul writes this, having charisma that differ according to the charis given to us, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in simplicity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, not let love be genuine, but literally the love genuine. Now I should say, I should totally, right, totally let love be genuine. But if I hear that as a law, I try to make myself love genuinely, which makes my love disingenuous. It's love constrained by law rather than love constraining me to fulfill the law. It's not love that's free, and so it's not really love. So um, Paul writes, the love genuine, abhorring the evil, being joined to the good, and who is the good class? We know this, right? Being joined to the good. In the brotherly love in one another, lovingly affectionate. I love that because he puts all the words for love just in that one phrase. In showing honor, outdoing one another, which means competing at putting other people first. That's a great phrase too. In the zeal not slothful, in the spirit fervent, in the Lord being servant, in the hope rejoicing, in the tribulation enduring, in the prayer constant, in the needs of the saints sharing, hospitality to strangers pursuing. See, Paul isn't telling us what to do. Although he will literally sacrifice his own life in order to see this happen. He's not telling us what to do. He's describing something that he sees being done. In fact, the only thing that he tells us to do in all of this is in those first two verses, Romans 12, 1 through 2. Number one, don't be conformed to this age. And number two, be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And this happens when we present our bodies a sacrifice. But then in verses 3 through 13, Paul does not tell us what to do, but describes something that he sees being done. I think he sees what my daughter saw. I think it's the thing he saw 14 years before when he was caught up to the third heaven. He sees the age to come invading the age, this age of space and time. He sees the life on the other side of the curtain becoming the life in you and me. When Jesus was crucified, you remember the curtain I mean, it's so cool. It's there in all the texts. He delivers up his spirit in all the gospels and the curtain rips. Rips from top to bottom and the life gets out. In fact, it's here in us, right? It's with us right now. It's on the table and it's bottled up in each one of us, each of us, an earthen vessel. Hey, look, here's some earthen vessels. Kind of like uh, dirt clods. And we all come to church looking a little bit uh, like, like this. Um, and when we hear love as a law, well, then we look uh, even, even more like this. Why is that? Well, it's because the preacher or someone says love looks like this. And, well, his dirt clod is a little fatter or bigger than your dirt clod. So in your insecurity, you pack on a little more dirt, a little more Adamah uh, in Hebrew. And it's in this way that everyone ends up looking just the same at church. So what happens when we think that we are our own salvation and so judge each other according to the flesh, according to the dirt cloud, dirt clod. <laughs> the dirt clod is Mises. That's a psyche that thinks it must save itself with more of itself. So it just acquires more and more dirt. But if we're preaching the word, we're not preaching Mises, but Jesus. Jesus means God is salvation. 
which means I am not my own salvation, and so I'm not trapped in me, but I can love my neighbor as myself. So to preach Jesus is to judge Mises. It's to judge the psychologos in which we are all trapped. To judge the psychologos with the theologos, the mind of God. And to judge is to cut. Hey, look right here. Keep it on the back of the cross. Here's, here's a cutter. I'm preaching Jesus. If I'm preaching Jesus, the word will cut Mises, that is our flesh. I mean, I, mean, I got another one. This is more like the one in the temple, the knife in the temple. It will, what, it, what, it, what it cuts away is uh, our fig leaves. What, what, I'm sorry about the cleaning. Anyway, it uh, cuts away our fig leaves. What we use to cover up the fact or the, the revelation that we're each um, incomplete and each of us is different. The word cuts away the fig leaves. And, and the word, well, it also kind of like reams us out because, you know, we get, we get kind of like uh, full of ourselves. We try to complete ourselves with our with ourselves so we fill the earthen vessel with earth the earth cuts away the self that you have made revealing the self that god has made and and god has made each of us uh different in elementary school, the girls made the boys nervous. The boys made the girls nervous, which ironically made all of us try to be just the same. That's how the human ego handles differences. It works to make everyone just the same. But in 1974, I bumped into this girl named um, Susan, and for some reason we kept bumping into each other for nine years until May 28th, 1983, we did this. And now I know some of you are thinking, hey, that looked kind of sexual. <laughs> yeah, a plumber calls this the male end and this the female end. And so some will say, yeah, but uh, you just did that in church. Yep. The Bible is all about this. Communion in a covenant. The problem comes with this. That's called divorce. This is actually the very first commandment from before uh, the fall. And Paul tells us that it's a sign like a sacrament. A sacrament. Now, Susan and I are 61, and our ability to do this with our physical bodies is not what it used to be. However, our ability to do this with our psychicos bodies, our souls, has maybe never been better. And so the fact that she's different than me is no longer a threat to me. It's no longer a curse to me, but it's actually the greatest blessing for me. You know, it used to be that I was utterly intimidated with people who had prophetic giftings like my wife. I mean, sometimes it's really freaky and weird, and I've always wanted it, and I really don't have what she has. And I can tell you that Susan absolutely abhors public speaking. I cannot get her to do this. And so I'll do the speaking and she'll tell me what to say. <laughs> and you see, it's all to the glory of God, for it's not me or she, but it's him in us, his body. Paul was single. But Paul thinks that marriage is a sign of our relationship with Christ, and check this out, Christ is in everyone you meet. Jesus is somehow encased in their Mises. 
To the Sadducees, Jesus said, they neither marry nor are given in marriage in the resurrection of the age to come. And I doubt that's because Susan and I will have to get a divorce in order to get into heaven. I think that's because, well, everyone will be married in heaven. In other words, everyone will be bound in a covenantal communion of sacrificial love. We will be what we truly are, one body. The two will become one flesh, and this refers to Christ and the church. And Christ is freaky, but he's hidden in your neighbor. And I'm absolutely not talking about an orgy. That makes an idol of the sign and ends up destroying the substance by tearing everyone apart. So if you're worried about sex, like you have this sexual hang-up or that sexual hang-up or, oh, geez, I'm not talking about sex. But I am talking about the thing that Jesus calls his bride. Not wheezes, which is a whole bunch of meases all taped together. <laughs> not, 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 not wheezes, but the living body of Jesus, the church. You see, each and every one of us is different. Male and female is a parable in our flesh, revealing what we are to do with the differences, the differences that God has created in each one of us in our souls. Each and every one of us is different by design. But each and every one of us has hidden our differences in fear and, and shame, right? Yeah, we've all hidden our differences. I should baptize this one. We've hidden our differences in fear and shame, and we've filled ourselves um, with ourselves, which is insanity. <laughs> So we do not need you to be just the same as, as your neighbor. We actually desperately need you to be, um, to be different than your neighbor. We need you to be yourself or uh, we cannot be uh, ourself because we are um, a, a body, and so I can't be myself unless you are your uh, self. Let's see here. Yeah, I think that one goes there because uh, we, ooh, and this, yeah, this guy goes here, I think, because we are, we are a, a body uh, brought together under um, a head, anacephalio, recapitu, recapitulato. We desperately need you to be yourself but you see, you will only find yourself if you lose yourself in Jesus. For you are not just a knee or a foot or a shoulder. You are what I am, the body of Christ, which is Christ in me. You see, it's only when we are connected that the prophets can truly prophesy the servers truly serve, the teachers teach, the exhorters exhort, the contributors contribute, the leaders lead, and the do-gooders do good for all the charisma, all the charisma are manifestations of, of the chorus, the grace that flows from the throne and through all the members of the body. It's only then that love is genuine when it's no longer a law but literally a life. And so look, it seems as if I have built the body of Christ. But this is my point. This, hallelujah, is not the body of Christ. This is an imitation body of Christ. If you said that in Greek, this is the antichrist, <laughs> the imitation body of Christ. I cannot build a body of Christ, but by the grace of God, maybe I can cut you. 
and cut me. That's what makes my job so insane. Sometimes I feel like I'm going <laughs> crazy. But I can cut us by the grace of God with the, with the word of God. And by the grace of God, maybe we can provide places for all of us to bump into each other. You know, for 15 years, I was considered an expert at building churches, church growth. And for the next 15 years, considered pretty much the exact opposite. Ironically, doing exactly pretty much the same thing. Sometimes it seems as if there's been more cutting than communion. Sometimes I've wondered if there'll even be anything left. Sometimes, seriously, particularly over the last two years, I've thought, God, we're like just a remnant. <laughs> Can you do anything with a remnant? <laughs> well, for the first 15 years, the second 15 years, one thing has seriously always amazed me. I mean, this amazed me up at Lookout, and it's amazed me for the last 15 years down here, and that is that everything truly real and lasting, everything that is truly real and lasting when I look back, was not the result of me and my wonderful plans and strategies, but the result of people who'd been cut by the word and then just bumped into each other. I think that's how the church started. Some people just cut to ribbons by the word and then bumping into each other in the upper room, and then a miracle happened. That's how the sanctuary started. A bunch of bleeding people who said, could we just get together? And I said, I guess so. There are too many stories to tell, but some people bumped into each other years ago and made some movies. Other people bumped into those movies and said, hey, can we be like your sister church? Actually, a bunch of churches, hundreds of people, in, maybe thousands in the, in the Philippines. Other people bumped into each other here and in Texas and said, could we do some conferences? People bumped into each other there and started all sorts of things in all sorts of places. Other people said, can we boost this online? And now sometimes thousands connect to us from all over the world, especially in the Relentless Love Facebook page. Some businessmen bumped into each other and said, hey, can we buy this building and could we start a website and could we buy cameras so that we could videotape this? Others said, can we take care of the garden? Um, could we start some groups? Could we care for people that are hurting? Uh, could we have a dance? Could we have a party at the, at the lake? And yet the things that really matter, well, they aren't really programs or events, but relationships that remain long after this 501c3 that we call the sanctuary is gone. What matters is that you connect with someone who is not simply conformed to this age, but being transformed by the age to come, who maybe will stand by your bed as you take your last breath and help you have courage to believe. That's what matters. And why wouldn't that happen? Well, it wouldn't happen if you won't believe that the dirt clod sitting next to you contains treasure. And it wouldn't happen if you won't believe that the treasure is not their creation or your creation, as if you had to compete about it, but the creation of God. And it wouldn't happen if you won't believe that God will not abandon his creation, but is, in fact, redeeming all of his creation. And... It, and, and if you don't believe that we are not joined by our strengths, we are joined by our weaknesses at the point of the wound where Mises is cut from Jesus and we begin to bleed mercy. It won't happen if you won't present your bodies a sacrifice. And so this is what I'm asking of you if you do call us your church that you'd present your body as a sacrifice. <laughs> Number one, come to our worship service. Come to worship and let the word cut you. And if you can't come to this place, which most of you cannot, well, let it cut you online, and then I hope you have communion. Yes, we have communion. But that's number one. Let the word cut you. And then number two, bump into each other, particularly at the point of the wound. If you watch online, maybe you could watch with somebody else. 
But no matter what, I hope you would share your wound with somebody else. That place you lost Mises and you began to bleed Jesus. I think that's where you'll discover your charisma, <laughs> your particular gift. If you live in the Denver area, I hope you'll bump into each other here after the service in a life group, sacred space, just goofing around. We now have two new pastors that I just think are awesome. Both, both, yeah, yay, Brett and John, and both of them, both of them are tasked with making space for us to bump into each other and then nurture the stuff that begins to grow. And that's how you discover your gifts, your charisma. You bump into people and bleed charis, that's grace. Sounds like death, but it turns out to be eternal life. A great place to start would be the discovery retreat that we're having this coming weekend. I think it'll be a great place to start, but you can sign up after the service. But now, we're out of time. So in all sincerity, this is everything. This is everything that I'm wanting to say. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. <laughs> Saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, and after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup. And he said, this is the covenant in my blood. It's a marriage covenant. This is a covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of God. May it cut us. Cut the Mises from Jesus. Then may it bind us together in one man. The love genuine, abhorring the evil, joined to the good, the brotherly love, lovingly affectionate, uh, competing at putting others first, in the zeal not slothful, in the spirit fervent, in the Lord being servant, in the hope rejoicing, in the tribulation enduring, in the prayer constant, in the needs sharing, hospitality pursuing, the river not damned, but flowing through one and through all. And uh, to him be the glory forever. Amen. You should have seen Susan's face when she walked up to do communion. I know this look. <laughs> That's a mess. But actually, this is exactly what's going on. Well, not exactly. My representation of what's going on here. And this is actually how church is supposed to look. A mess. Because we come here to be re-deconstructed and reconstructed into the image of God. Um, and so uh, we're kind of stepping out into a new season this fall. And uh, I mean, I, I have honestly wondered at times, God, do you want a worshiping group of people here? Because um, I realize that we kind of offend on the left and we offend on the right and Ever since I started preaching that God has consigned all the disobedience in order that he may have mercy and all. Uh, wow, I always preached it, but I think at some point I said, no, I think Paul really meant it. But I think God does want us here. I mean, for 15 years, I've, I've really thought, God, you know, look, I'm, I, can, I can deliver packages, that's fine. I know that you want me to keep speaking and we can do that another way, but... For 15 years, I think, I said, no, I want people gathering and worshiping together. And, and this is what I think. And people always say, well, what do you want us to do? Well, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> um, and I, I want you to present yourselves a sacrifice to come to worship or to worship online and allow yourself to be cut and then seriously to bump into each other. <laughs> That's why church programs are always so frustrating for me because I go, well, in one way, it's an impossible thing because it's, it's a miracle. 
in another way, it's the simplest thing in the world. If, if you're lonely, invite somebody to lunch. <laughs> Go for a bike ride together. Be a part of a small group. And, and ask yourself this question. Uh, uh, God, what do you have for me? How am I supposed to give my charisma to the sanctuary? And then ask us, ask us to help you do it. That's why pastors are called shepherds, because they're dealing with something living that has to be nurtured and brought together. I mean, so really everything I'm saying is believe the gospel. And I remind you that a great way to start in that is to sign up for this Discovery Weekend. Uh, John and Kathy will be out in the back. But no matter what, bump into people, okay? In Jesus' name, amen.